<laughs> so, and then we'll minimise that so we don't see everyone. We are recording this evening and it will be on YouTube at some point in the next week as well. Um, and we've got a bit of begging because um, every little helps at the moment. And so if anyone feels um, like they would wish to help out with a couple of our appeals, um, St Alder, we're still fundraising for completing the restoration there. And also you can donate to the uh, museum in general as well. And one of the things we should say, anything that goes to the museum really helps um, progress the collection. And recently at auction, um, we were able to acquire some Real images artists. from HC Cassily's collection. And some of those are in Dave's talk this evening. So I'll stop wittering on now and we'll hand over um, to Dave. Okay, um, well, just a, a little bit of a preamble. Um, I gather, Jigsaws have come back into vogue during this lockdown, and this is actually a bit of a jigsaw. The problem we had was that the pieces were in different boxes spread all around the, the archive. And we think we've pulled together about three quarters of the picture. There's a couple of pieces that are out of place, and there's a couple of bits where we go a bit vague. But this is going to be the story as we have seen it so far. Um, when you go past Merthwaite now, it just looks a bit of a mess and it, it looks a bit insignificant. But it actually, it came back. The railway started because of the industrial requirement um, for the hematite but the resurgence of the industrial side was actually what allowed the railway to survive because in the 20s into the 30s, we wouldn't have survived on just the seasonal passenger traffic. So uh, let's get into the pictures. I apologize for the quality of the first two um, now that we know they exist, we're chasing better quality pictures, but this one's from a book and it's the earliest picture we know of the quarry in action. And I thought it was particularly appropriate that they were starting out with horses and carts. That didn't last long. Um, we very quickly got into transport by rail. Um, the next picture is also a bit vague in that it's a very low definition copy from Cumbria County Council and it shows, if we can go on please Stuart, um, it shows at the right hand corner the only picture we've got so far of sets. Um, apparently when everything first set up, Sir Aubrey set up a cooperative with two families, the Hollands and the Nortons. The Hollands were quarrymen, the Nortons initially were set makers. And the set making didn't last very long. So these are they. We think Cyril Holland is third from the right on the, the row standing but we again haven't any great confirmation. So they started knocking big lumps out of the um, hillside. And on the left in that picture, you see two guys working and we go to a close up of them. And the drills they were using took quite a bit of welly to actually get them into the hole. And the guy who sit in there turned the drill through a quarter turn on each hammer stroke to keep the hole circular. And those drills, they'd start off with a, a two foot one. And then once that got down to this sort of area, then they'd move on to a longer one and so on and so on. And the longest drills they had were 16 feet. So you can imagine the effort that took. So 
this is them. Every, everything, absolutely everything in the quarry was manual. Yes, <laughs> very much so, Nigel. I mean, it, it's it's boggling, really, when you see the size of the hammer that they're welding. So everything was moved around by levers, and they actually had. They started to get some mechanical help. In the bottom right-hand corner of that picture, there's a, a guy hiding, and we've got a close-up of him, and he's operating a drill, which at the time was, you know, a great step forward, and it was powered by a vertical boiler, which you can just see there on the left. So that, that was how the initial power was brought in. Then, uh, where am I? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the reasons that they were able, right through to 1955, they were able to guarantee that there was no soil or other rubbish in amongst the soil, in, the, in amongst the stone. And the reason why they did that was that up till 1955, everything was loaded by hand from the quarry and the stones are broken down to be able to fit through a nine inch square hole so that the pressure can cope with it. They had a couple of little couple type tippers to move stuff around within the setup. And there's one of the Haywoods right at the end there waiting to take them down. Um, it's slightly curious that they were using um, the two-ton tippers, but I don't think they actually had the strength to use them in the tippler, which was where they were designed. So fairly quickly afterwards, it, it opened up initially in 1923, and there happened to be two conferences down at the Furness Abbey Hotel. And the first was LMS district officers, and the second were superintendents so they, they arranged a little jolly outing for them and this is them inspecting Beckford Quarry and I think it's the second one yeah um, all these sort of high-powered guys just sitting in what were effectively orange crates but they seemed to enjoy it and the whole idea was to get the LMS to buy the ballast that we were producing. Um, we have to move on because I'm not sure where we are. Oh yeah, <clears throat> um, Ella was occasionally used up at the top end, uh, although mainly Ella was used from the quarry down to Ravenglass. Esk was built for the stone traffic and there are actually very, very few pictures of Esk doing the job it was designed for. That's one of them. And it was taking a reasonable rake of uh, stone. They could take up to 16 wagons. Um, so a reasonable amount at a time. And it was probably as much as could be handled, um, loaded in one or two days and then picked up and taken down. Um, after the vertical boiler, Muriel was used for a while before she was converted and she provided power for the drills. And we'll see later that she ended up back there once they pinched all the, the decent bits from her. Um, Later on, 1926-ish, we got the first of our Muir Hills, and this is Quarryman, um, the first one, and that helped to take the pressure off the other locos. So it was it was a great benefit. Um, and there's a good example of three three sorts of power. Got Quarryman at the front, the old vertical boiler which hung around for ages. And then um, Muriel's boilers sitting on a tender, on a flat rather, um, with a two-ton wagon as the tender. 
And I did ask Stuart if when we did the quiz a while ago about how many tenders had there been on the railway, whether this one was included. And it wasn't just a, a two week affair, it was there for two years before it was replaced. Um, so it went on for a while. Then a quick shot you know, down from the top of the, the quarry. This is obviously a, a later stage, uh, it's probably into the 40s. Um, and one of the Muir Hills is just gathering together a train. Um, it's, it always surprises me when on this view how close the road and the river and the railway are to each other just on that bend. Then this is the third of the Muir Hills. This is NG41 um, with its uh, purpose-made roof, <laughs> which presumably did the job. Then in 1949, we jump forward to what they called the big blast. And this is a wide shot. And you can see just slightly left of center frame, there's a, an oblong black hole. And that fault line runs down to the quarry floor. So if we go in a bit, that's the hole. And you can start to see the scale because there's five guys standing at the bottom. And they are Tom Jones, Billy Bell, the Smith, a guy called W. Robson. We don't actually know very much about him. And then Billy's son, Eric, and Jack Graves, who was the, the foreman in the quarry at the time. And in that little hole behind them, they dug in 50 feet, um, made a, a fairly large tunnel 50 feet. And then they went left and right and formed a cross tunnel that was 80 feet long. Then they filled it with about 10,500 pounds of explosives, then filled in that first tunnel with granite again to stop the explosion coming out, and then detonated it. And as often happens in really big events, um, you've got five guys there who slaved away for ages. And then on the day, you've got a whole crowd of people who turn up for the event. Sound familiar? So they all wandered off, presumably over Trough House Bridge and walked over to the other side of the river. And from there, they got a, a view of what was happening. So that's before the blast. Then as the blast happened, it obviously shook the ground because the camera person was shaken at that point as well. And as everything settled, a huge cloud of dust went up and they started playing. <laughs> yes. Um, and that's the end result afterwards. Um, there's about 50,000 tons of granite there, which kept them going for another six years until the whole operation shut down. So that's where the raw material came from for most weight. And that's just a yeah, that's just a a nice observation of how much a million tons takes up because they reckoned the overall hole was a million tons big. And if we now go down to Murthwaite, this sketch is actually quite useful because some of the others have been done in a straight line. And I've put in the big oak so that we've got a reference point that the, the line actually curves at that point and the passing loop is a bit further on than most people would expect. And the incline siding um, was built up using the waste from the quarry, they had to dig out quite a lot of soil and rock that was perished because it had been exposed to daylight. 
So if we can go on, Stuart. So they brought all that sort of rubbish rock, if you like, down and built the embankment to a reasonable height. <clears throat> and when it became obvious that they were running out of stone, they carried the last hundred feet on concrete pillars, which you can just see in the background. So they're going to fill up to the pillars. And there's a couple more shots of the pillars themselves. The gentleman moved, but you know, if I was balanced there, I might. Um, so they used a fair bit of concrete in producing this. And the idea was that because there wasn't an awful lot of power around at the time, there was no electricity. Um, that didn't come till 1935, till all of this development was over. So lighting was difficult, candles and duck lamps, and most of the power apart from that produced by the tiny oil engine, they had to plan for. So hence, they, they brought the stone at a high level. And you can go on to the next one, Stuart. And the high level siding is on the top level of that. And on the right there, you can see they've actually placed the crusher about 15 feet in the air so that you could tip straight into the crusher. And then from there, it would run into the screens that you can see in the background there. So they used gravity rather than elevators because it saved on power, because uh, power was essential. Uh, that's when they were still building it. And again, you can see the crusher and you can see from the two gentlemen standing there that it's quite a long way up. And to support it, they made quite a large concrete pillar, um, which you can sort of see below it, but it was large and substantial. Then this is the view from the other side once quite a lot of the covering in work had, had happened. So you can see the high level siding at the top tipping into the crusher, which is now behind the top section and into the screen. Then that's the completed high level going up to it. And just a, a more distant view. Um, once they'd got everything sorted, they then gave themselves a little bit of a shelter over the top. Um, and already you can see the problem. Because Greenlee and Robert Proctor Mitchell designed the plant from the viewpoint of model engineers rather than industrial engineers, there were several faults built into the original plant. And one of those was the capacity of the bins was two tons. Hence, if you wanted a lot of one grade, the other bins still had to be emptied and put somewhere, and you can see where. <laughs> and this is actually jumping forward because this is a piece of the puzzle that we only discovered two weeks ago. And the, as all the development came from that original towards Ravenglass, so this is the first engine house after the original that was built in. But what intrigued us on this one is under the first set of screens, thank you, <laughs> that is actually the original set of screens. So it was only two weeks ago we discovered that there were two sets of screens. So that's a, a jump forward to illustrate new pieces of the jigsaw that we're finding. Then that's a view along the high level siding and it's a bit boring really. <laughs> so in building that second section, they used the same principle again and decided that the crusher would be fed from the high level. 
And right in the center, you can see a huge lump of concrete. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> and that huge lump of concrete is simply to support the second crusher. The other fun bit, and the reason why I like this picture is uh, that's one of Sir Arthur Hayward's two tipper wagons in the foreground. And they were lovely because they not only tipped, but they rotated on the base of the flat. So you could actually turn them into any direction before you started tipping. And it just struck me as a really good piece of design. So we're back to that same sort of setup. This is now a second engine house with a second crusher and a second set of screens. And the vertical pipes are cooling water pipes, the equivalent of a radiator for the new engine, which was quite a bit more powerful and produced quite a bit more heat. Um, and their version of a radiator. <laughs> this one, excuse me. This one, again, we, we only found recently. And you know, I was saying that if you produce a lot of one type of stone, you have a lot of excess. This was a slightly more efficient way of recycling it in that they would tip over to the left into the bays and then when they wanted to refill the wagons they could do it with them on the the ground level if you like so in both cases you were shoveling down which you know is still hard work but is better than shoveling upwards um, the only view we have of the power source um, that's the original tangy engine and jack lister who had been with the old railway as a driver and fitter did some driving in the early days but by 1922 he was getting quite deaf and he came to take over looking after the engine and he was followed by bert turner who had a background in agricultural machines um, and fairgrounds, so he, he was ideal. He incidentally was um, the person who built Inglenook. Wait for a comment. <laughs> um, okay, so again, th this has caused a little bit of confusion. Um, when Greenlee was building the layout, he had to have seven. Oh, right. <laughs> um, he had to have seven different lines for the seven bins with seven different grades in. And he reasoned quite reasonably, I suppose, that seven sets of points or six sets of points would be very expensive. And this was a more cost-effective way of getting around it. The drawback was that everything had to be brought back to this center point to come in and out of the yard. And then because it only took one wagon at a time, it meant there was a lot of handling. We think that's actually a very young Tom Jones just behind the, the tipper, not the guy operating, we, we don't know who he is. Um, this was the second visit, these were the superintendents. Um, yeah, there was space, but um, apparently Greenley's argument was it was cheaper. Um, I think if they brought the yard further back, they, they could have put more points in. But um, someone coming back? 
I'll carry on regardless. Interrupt me if you can. Um, <laughs> so whereas the um, district officers who were very posh um, came by themselves, the superintendents all brought their wives along to the Furness Abbey and had quite a, a good jolly. So this is Colossus and Sir Aubrey taking them up to Dale Garth, which stops off. And again, just as a, a sales. And another confusion that we've been able to sort a little bit is the six ton bogey hoppers. We, we are now absolutely certain that they came in 1927, not 28 or 29 or whenever, um, because we have a, a dated photo. And that's a good comparison between the original granite wagons and the six ton hoppers. And it was a substantial improvement in efficiency. I think that one, yeah, that's the one that we have that is dated June, excuse me, 1927. So you've got ICL2 there and a couple of the, the hoppers. There's some gash bits of screens in the foreground. Then <laughs> a quick example of how the screens worked. They were obviously knocking up some more concrete. So you've got Henry Greenley on the left and Harry Hilton just rotating the screen and two laborers shoving stones onto it so that you get a particular grade. That's the best demonstration we could find. Uh, right, now we get into, this is where you might have to concentrate a bit because there are several pieces of the jigsaw missing and this plan helped us to work out how things changed. So this is between 27 and 29. And the first radical thing they did was at the top of the picture, they turned the screens through 90 degrees so that the um, loop was a single or two loops under the screens and made life a lot better. They also increased the capacity of the bins from two tons to 150 tons, which also helped efficiency a bit. And at this stage, with more powerful engines to drive, towards the bottom, there's a three inch diameter shaft which ran through the whole building and they took belts off to drive individual breakers. They actually ended up with four separate breakers. The key one initially was the green one, um, which was the bigger one, a really chunky industrial one. And that fed an elevator which took the material up to the screens. Any of the rejects came down on the left hand side to the pink breaker. And uh, yes, sorry, it is um, a, a plan view. Yeah. Um, so from the pink breaker, it was then dropped back into a pit under the green breaker and then went up the elevator and everything worked. Then the second part of the development was they brought in a primary breaker, which was the blue one, and that fed a Simmons disc breaker, which when it was installed in 1929 was the first in England. And it provides quite a good contrast between the quarry still breaking and loading effectively by hand and this relatively high tech setup. So we'll just try and break it down a bit, uh, please Stuart. And looking at the, the main breaker, that sat over a pit. And obviously you can see the green elevator going up to the screens. And the side view of the pit shows 
that it was quite substantial. We were told from drawings that the pit was 16 feet deep, dug out by hand in two weeks of rain. So you can imagine it wasn't uh, the best setup. And then the elevator takes everything up. So that's that's the primary breaker. Then that's a photo of the primary breaker and the elevator going up to these massive concrete bins behind. And any rejects, oh, sorry, I've got wider shots. No, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so it's just looking back a bit um, and you can see the elevator going up and feeding into the screens. Then once we're back to an overhead view again, any rejects that didn't go through the holes in the screens were fed by the pink shoots back to a secondary breaker which broke everything up and then popped it back into the same pit. And we have a photo of, oh, sorry, we have a side view of that just to prove that it goes back into the pit. And then we have a photo and you can see the, the shoots coming down to this breaker. And this one's quite good because it gives us a point of reference in the next picture the wheel of her that you can see is actually the side of the, the breaker. And you can also see behind the black vertical pipes from the original extension to the engine house. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're moving along. And just a, again, a, a slightly wider shot. And in the right hand corner is the top of the previously mentioned Haywood Tipper, which didn't survive to go in the museum. Then we, on this one, we haven't got enough pieces of the jigsaw to work out exactly what happened. We think the breaker, the primary breaker, which isn't colored in, fed via an elevator to the Simmons disc machine, which was, if you can imagine two cones, one on top of the other, and the lower cone has a broader, flatter touch to it. The stone is fed into the top. And as it progresses down the side of the cone, it becomes smaller and smaller as it's crushed. And then the bits all come out of the the, uh, the outlet there and we think went back again into the main pit so that main pit elevator was doing quite a lot of work it was it was carrying most of it and the we we have two pictures of the Simmons and it's that cylindrical object at the back of the picture with the feed into it from above and that's from the other side. Now, it's although it's lower than the other ones, it was on a lump of concrete that was nine feet square and seven feet high. So again, a substantial lump of concrete. And we have to remember here that as far as we're aware, all of the concrete on the job was mixed by hand, which, which boggles me, because when you see the, the volume of stuff they put in, it's, it really is amazing. Um, this, this is just the back of that picture and illustrates how grateful we are to Mary Fair. Um, very few other photographers would have bothered to take a photo of the inside of a machinery plant. And curiously, we get more information from her prints than we do 
from her negative index, the, the official index, because that was very sparse. And on this, she's actually putting captions for the pictures for publication, in this case, with an article. Um, and we do get a lot more information from the back of prints, which is why we're always keen to see the backs. <laughs> Sorry, Stuart, we can go on now. Um, that's actually, it's one of the ones that's out of place. Um, the blue is the primary breaker that feeds the Simmons disk machine. Okay. And that's the primary breaker and its own elevator that fed to the Simmons. Yeah. Again, <clears throat> it's, it's a little difficult to see, but you see the size of the concrete lump that the Simmons crusher is, is sitting on. It's, it's massive. Yep. And a shot from the fell side. Um, the high level siding is still in place. And one of the reasons for that was that when they were assembling the new set of screens, which you can just see behind the pitched roof, they brought all the materials up on railway wagons. I and mean, you're looking at between four and six tons for the assembled screens and trying to assemble them 30 or 40 feet in the air it was probably quite interesting. <laughs> and that is probably one of the essential wagons that we had because remember, the oil engines had to be fed. It had to go up to Beckfoot um, to feed the Tangy engine when that went up to feed everything. So fuel was actually quite important. And that's on the frame of one of the old two-ton granite wagons. All right. Then remember I said the the line bent at the, the big oak. Well, Stuart's very kindly pointing to the big oak. And it actually helps to place things in context because on the right hand side, there's the plant. And up around the big oak, then there's quite a large loop. And we don't know why there's so much stuff dumped on the sides, whether the plant had actually been broken for several days and they wanted to get stuff at least down and out of the quarry. You can't really see the point in double handling, but we just don't know. Then that's the loop in operation with Esk, again unusually, on a stone train. Harry Hilton standing on the one of the wagons there, keeping an eye on things, and a normal train going past. This one's good because um, it gives us a chance to have a go at Tully House. When Tully House did a copy version of Mary's Next in the 1980s, not only did they not copy all of the names, but they cropped some of them. And this is the best example of why you shouldn't crop things because as you look at that view, you can't really tell what's going on. There's a bloke there with his back to you with a, a bowler hat. But over on the very right of the frame on our prints, there's a guy who looks very much like a valet standing there at attention. And because of the time, this would be after 1929, Sir Aubrey had just died and Sir Thomas had taken over and was keen to get everything moving along. And this is the only picture we have of Sir Thomas on the railway and he's got his back to us, but never mind. This is another of the pieces of the jigsaw that jumped into the wrong place. Um, people will tell me whether or not it's good practice, but the practice was rather than shunting and faffing around at Beckfoot, they pushed the wagons back up into place, then swapped over and 
brought the loaded ones down. I suppose at least they were empty if they were pushing them. A quick look. Um, this is actually the siding that goes off that loop towards Merthyr Quarry. Um, and we only have one picture of the quarry itself. This is, um, sorry, can we go back to it? <laughs> um, I'm doing this for Mike. Um, this is the part built um, Haywood Saloon that came to Ravenglass and was finished at Ravenglass. And at this time, it still has the bogies on it. And alongside it is our famous weed killing machine. And you can see how the pump is driven from the back axle there. And in the, it's in that one, but in the next one, we get a better view. We think that the strange contraption in the front is actually the top half of a wagon turntable that was in Merthyr Quarry because it seems to have rollers at sort of north, south, east and west and a pair of rails. And we don't know what happened to that. That's long since disappeared. But the base is actually still at Ravenglass. That's it in situ. And you can imagine the rollers working on, on the base. Right. <laughs> That's another shot. This Slightly later, this is 1950 or 51, and you can see the, the poor old Hayward is disappearing rapidly. It's lost its uh, bogies. And Sir Aubrey's tipper wagon is also gently rusting away as it has continued to do so. Then, oh, this is the only shot we know of, or certainly the only one we have in our collection of Merthyr Quarry itself. It wasn't developed to a, a great degree um, because the quality wasn't as good as Beckfoot. Now we're not saying that this is actually posed for the photo, but the front half of the train are rocks from Beckford Quarry. The back half of the train are processed stone. So maybe it was staged. <laughs> and then the next great development was to install standard gauge to minimize the handling down at, at rain glass in the you could bring standard gauge wagons up, get them filled, and just hand them over effectively at, at the bottom end. And this is, although it's a slightly later picture, it does at least show how everything crossed over. And one of our recent additions from the Casserly connection is he, he took quite a few photos from the back of the train. And when you see a couple later on, um, we think that in 1950, it was quite impressive to get things as sharp as that. That's the uh, Kerr Stewart. And again, in the foreground, an oil tank, um, a fuel tank. And a view of how they actually loaded up. Um, Tom Jones says it was pure coincidence that they were actually able to get wagons under the bins. And they did spend a couple of days scraping off nebs of concrete to allow the wagons in there. So it was a bit of a tight fit, but it worked. And a couple more pictures. These are post-war. Um, just the general layout. I think that one was a um, Robin Buttrell. This one is a Rick Isles. And again, just shows the general operation 
lots of stuff lying around um, mid foreground uh, that are two or three crusher jewels just lying there, presumably uh, having been used. Uh, don't really say much about that. All the same sort of view. And by now we're up to the 50s. So I think this is 51. I think this is a CRA one. And this, these are the two that we really liked. Uh, we bought some nakes recently um, belonging to H.C. Castleby. And this again is, is two shots taken in fairly quick succession from the train on the return journey. So you've got NG41 doing its bit and actually looking reasonably pristine. And then seconds later, he managed to catch that one. We think the guy coupling up is the foreman. Oh. Uh, I can't comment on that. <laughs> um, we think that's the foreman, a guy called Harold Niven. Um, and it, it's really good. Most of the shots we have of the Coast Stewart are just it, sitting there in various locations, but not actually doing anything. Ah, we, we'll come to that in a minute, <laughs> David. Um, Ah, right, there's people answering questions that I'm, <laughs> I'll, I'll actually uh, need to make a note of. Um, we'll get back to that. Okay, so that's that one. Um, slightly intriguing because we're fairly sure that um, this is Cyril Holland and Bert Thompson sitting on the Coast Jurt. And as seems to happen right the way through history, the proper allocated driver for each particular loco is someone else entirely. Um, Jim, I'm trying to think. Can't remember the second name, but at the time, the allocated driver was Jim somebody and yet you find Bert sitting in there and there are quite a lot of pictures if you remember Ella down at Raven Glass which was in the historical series um, Bert was allocated to Muriel <laughs> but when it came to taking a picture Bert was standing next to Ella and there are several instances where Mary Fair was taking photos of Esk and Bert was definitely not the allocated driver, but he appears in all the pictures. <laughs> Seems to be a talent he had. Right. Now, this, this raises several questions. The first and most obvious one is, how did they get the engine off? Because apart from possibly having an A-frame made from timber, or at least a tripod made from timber. How on earth did they get the engine, even you know, get it up high enough to take the wheels off? Um, there was one point, if we can just go back one, Stuart, um, the little canister shaped bit at the front end is the starter motor. <laughs> just thought we'd throw that in. Right, off we go again. This is actually an historic picture, which we got from Tom Jones. And it says, July, 1955, the last trip by the Coast Stewart from Merthwaite before it was sold. Mm -hmm. uh, what does the side into the left? Um, pass on that one, Ryan, I'll come back to you. So obviously this is post 
1935 because electricity has arrived. And you saw the size of the tangy engine behind Jack Lister. This was its replacement. This is a 120 horsepower electric engine, just belted up to the same shaft and driving everything. I think there's one more of it. Yeah. And I know we haven't got people there in terms of scale, but it's it's not massive. Yes, it could be, Graham. Yeah, could be. Right, carry on. Now, David was asking just now about, was that the only standard gauge locomotive that got to Merthweight? There was a query that Di Pickup picked up um, from a chat line, and there was a comment that somewhere in the early 50s, there was a standard gauge Muir Hill at Merthweight. I gather the person who saw it didn't see any movement, so we don't know what condition it was in. And this is one from down west. And again, it's a poor picture, but it's the only one we've got. And it's all right, Stuart, you can go on. Um, we finally found a clue in that we think that is the chassis of that particular Muir Hill. Uh, there's enough similarities to believe it. And it just appears to, again, to the left of centre behind the, or beside the um, company wagon, which looks as though it may have given up the ghost. Um, so we think there definitely was one there. <laughs> Another little, thank you. <laughs> um, there was another query which James Waterfield kindly solved for us. Everyone believed that in these pictures, the bend on the chassis of ICL2, which is what this is, was caused from the head-on collision with ICL1 in 1928. However, in James's book, he has a picture by Boyd, James Boyd, bottom picture of those and as you can see in 1948 the frames were square so the damage was done somewhere up at Merthweight as they were moving out the way from one place to another so that's all that this is very late 50s probably into the 60s and you can see it's looking a bit decrepit um, starting to look very tired. There aren't that many shots from the other side. And you can see um, just on the left there, the corrugated iron cover for the um, screens. Then what else have we got? <laughs> um, in the 60s, there was a great move to actually recover some of the timber from Merthweight, which actually prompted quite a bit of demolition. And Tom Jones apparently found out that they'd mixed the concrete quite well in that it was very difficult to dispose of. So Tom came up with his standard approach to things. If it's too big and heavy, put some uh, explosives on the joins, join them all up and set, set them off. So obviously being Tom and being cautious, he found somewhere out of sight to do it and waited till the smoke had cleared before they all went back. And the result was for quite a while, there was a, a mat of concrete debris that just sat there. But they'd recovered some very good timber from it um, that got reused. I think some of it got reused to build some of the opens um, in the 60s. 
I would do it. Yeah. From from then on, it sort of combined the the use as as a stall for things like rails and also as a dump. Oh, one thing that did try to go on in the 60s was they, they started a, or someone started a company called Red Block. And the idea was to use the Merthwear dust to make concrete blocks. And we have actually have some installed on site. The side of the carriage shed, which is now Dickie's workshop, is built up in those blocks. So if we need a sample to put into the museum, we know where, where we can go. Just shot at the same plant from the other side. As I was saying, it became a bit of a dump. Dave, so, Dave. it's Trevor here. Yeah. It was Mr. Bar Mr. Bartlett and the block making plant. All oh, right. Bartlett. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> Just add that to the, uh, the note. See, there's, there's always something comes out of this. It isn't just me boring you to death. Um, okay, so that's that's it. And that's Esk's old tender. And you can see from the assembled bits and pieces that quite a few things went there to die. I think there's another shot of Esk's tender. And, <laughs> um, oh, Mike Decker, I'll have to send you that one as well. Um, I thought I only had one of the picture of the um, NG41 in its latter stages. And that's S going by. <laughs> um, this is one that I have sent to Mike Decker. Um, and just left of centre there, you can see NG41. <laughs> yes, um, I'm, I'm sure Stuart would have uh, auctioned the tenders off. Quite what he would have done with the, the chassis of NG41, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Quarryman, however, survived, and this is uh, Graham giving it a drink to keep it going. And I think Trevor will tell us about the stack of timber that was on the left there. Um, I think they were standard gauge sleepers and they degraded and degraded and degraded and were only finally cleared away um, in the recent tidy up of, of Merthweight. But by then they were rotted and covered in vegetation, so you wouldn't have guessed they were there. So is Stuart. Um, this is just as things progressed, um, a view from the high level siding back towards Dale Garth, um, again with the big oak as a good reference point on the left there. Thank you. <laughs> and at the bottom of the high level siding, it actually ran into what used to be a loop, but the Dale Garth end points were taken out, so it became a siding for quite a while. And Trevor has one or two stories about the, uh, the siding and the use of it. Um, that's the view along the siding. I uh, can't tell you who the lady is on the left. Uh, yeah, Dave. Yeah. Can we go back? The siding there and on the left hand side going up the main line, that's get more spoil tip there out of the quarry or the quarry waste or whatever. Oh, right. And that embankment there was one of the things Cyril told me that when the railway inspector came to look at the railway to get it fit for passengers and not in 1961, he yeah. advised that that bank should be pushed back or dug out of the way because it was mm. one of the few places on the railway that when we were running wholly open trains, people could roll out of the offside and not escape. Oh, right. Somebody falling out of an open carriage on that yeah. side. 
they will go straight into the bank and back under the train. Now, we oh, never no. removed that bank until the winter of 1993, the end of the winter, 1993. It took till we took <laughs> that bank down. Now, what we did was get got the farmer from across the way with the JCB and he just pulled it all right back to flatten it. And we put a new fence line roughly where the top of the heap is there. Yeah. But just off to the left at the front, slightly off the picture, there's an embankment starting to be built. Mm. Now, a proper actual embankment, as if they weren't just tipping the waste, they were as if they were trying to make something. And there's still, or there was, two probably about four-inch square oak posts, as if they were ready to move the fence line. And I just had it in my head whether they were trying at some point, I don't know, 40s, whenever, to get the main line to go around the back of the sand pit to get it away from the works. Just to, you know, at the time, you could see what they were trying to do with the way this embankment was being built up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. Lovely. Yeah. I've, I've made a note. <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. But do you want the story about the side? You know, should we not tell it? No, you can tell it. Right. <laughs> Give people a break well, from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, used, we used to cross the first, sorry, the second train down in the morning from, from Dale Garth, which was 10 o'clock or 10.10, with the first up steam train from Ravenglass at 10.30. So the idea was that you would get down, clear the points just off the bottom left of the picture, set back into the siding and then walk to the top of the bank where the famous oak tree is and wave the up train through. Because obviously, you know, you were the guard, that was what you did. But on one particular occasion, we came down I hopped off to throw the points over. There was no thought about screwing brakes down or whether the train could stop. There was no air brakes or anything like that in those days. And dear old Pink Fazak, who was driving Roy Lanker, lost control of the four saloons. He couldn't actually pull up before he got over the brow by the oak tree <laughs> and ran away down the hill and disappeared around the corner. And I'm just stood there like a lemon because there's absolutely nothing you can do other than obviously run to the phone, but by that time it could be too late. Anyway, as it happened, the anchor and the four coaches came careering back round the corner and into the siding seconds before Benny on River Mike came hammering round the bottom corner. <laughs> so that was that was dodgy train control at its very, very worst. And that would be about 1973-74. Yeah. Probably 73. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. Haven't they suffered enough? Um, right. So, if we if we wander on, yeah, this is um, looking back up the the high level. They'd obviously been trimming quite a bit back um, at that stage. I have a feeling these are die pickup slides, so they'll be early 60s. Um, but again, it's really useful to have the, the big oak on the right there. And <laughs> yes, as I was saying, um, shall we say it became a storage area rather than a dump? Well, whatever. <laughs> and that's looking a little tidier and a little more organized. And um, we still think that's a useful space. <laughs> um, yes. The problem is in an operation such as we have, you're never quite sure what's gonna come in handy, or at least that's what I've been told. <laughs> we'll move swiftly on. <laughs> Just a, a quick aside, uh, this is up at 
fish ground, obviously. But the um, the little wagon behind Esk was built by Sixtons, and it was a five plank wagon. It was always well often used as the the luggage wagon, and it was rediscovered. Anna Murthwaite and it, uh, we'll say it was disinterred and taken up to Erden Road where you can sort of see the shape and I believe one or two people have an ambition to resuscitate it and uh, use it to carry brake gear and things for um, visiting engines. I'm not sure we'll be able to use the timber. Never mind. Right. And this, um, what I'll get Stuart to do is I'll get him to scoot fairly quickly through this because this is bringing us up to date um, on the great tidy up. And then we have a, a lovely little video as a finale from David Mosley, which will play in. Um, if you if you email me, Ross, I'll try and point it out. Um, I, I don't have control of the pictures up here, <laughs> but it's quite a long way back, but I'll, I'll dig you a picture out of it. Uh, if I put it up on the museum Facebook page, will that be okay? Is that all right, Ross? Good, thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, there's some lovely shots. Um, I'm sure it wasn't lovely to the people who were trying to dig stuff out um, in that weather. Nice, really nice picture of the three-way point. Still my favourite, even if it's awkward to uh, install. And then when we get through the stills, um, as I say, David Mosley has uh, provided us with a little montage of the the works, which means I can shut up for a while, as that is the finale. It shows how much we, this is me shutting up, shows how much we need the pictures because when things change, it's very difficult to imagine what they were like. And if David's worried about the music, Stuart doesn't want to pay for it on the rerun. Have you had a freeze? Oh no, you got it.
There's also a good contrast with the amount of work that was able to be done there. And the gang of something like 30 blokes with picks and shovels who took the embankment out at Ravenclass in under two months with picks, shovels and wheelbarrows. <laughs> It has been suggested that we plant a new oak close to the big oak so that when eventually we do lose the big oak, we still have a point of reference and a nice oak tree. And we threw that in right at the end because um, it's a, a lovely snapshot from uh, William Nash of 1924 down at Ravenglass. And the reason we were intrigued was on the left hand side there, there appears to be, excuse me, another crusher that's been offloaded but not taken up. So we can only assume that that was the 1924-25 rearrangement. But lots of nice little details, glass coach is there, the tipler gantry is still there. Um, a nice piece to finish on. Back to you, Stuart. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. I hope everyone's enjoyed that. Can we give Dave a virtual round of applause, please? <laughs> Thank you. I did.